I mean, this might work. Let's try it. Let's see if it works. I think this is going to work. Why did I think that was going to work? Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. Back on the steam engine this week, and I'm making the piston. And this is a ringed piston, which I've never made one of those before. So there was some interesting challenges there. And so this ended up being a video all its own. All right, let's go. When in doubt, start with what should be easy parts. Little do I know. I'm going to make the piston rod first. So the kit includes some stainless steel round bar for this. And I'm going to switch out to the three jaw chuck for this. A rarely discussed advantage of the three jaw chuck is that you can hold a smaller stock with it. Now something like a collet chuck is really ideal for this kind of work, but I don't have one. So here we go with the three jaw. You can see what a nasty pinch cut this stock has on it from the factory. So it'll take a fair amount of passes to face that off. I'm holding it with some aluminum can here to protect it because the outer surface of this round bar is going to be the final surface. Then I deburr that and then I face the other end and then I check the length and I face it down to the final length that we need. I'm going to make one small change to the piston rod because there's something here that I don't like. The drawing calls for 5 16 worth of 540 thread, but here on the piston you can see that it's 5 16 thick and there's a recess here for the nut for that thread. So what that means is there's thread through this hole. I don't really like that. I don't like the idea of the thread locating the rod on the piston because threads are not good locating tools. So what I would like to do instead is just make a shoulder here in this area. So that'll help locate the piston and then the threaded area will just be the end here. I'll make the thread a little bit longer than necessary here so that uh, to make sure that the nut has room to tighten down on it, but uh, I'll leave at least a little bit of shoulder, just any shoulder here at all, it wouldn't take much, would guarantee that the piston is properly located on that rod. I'll start with the big end of the piston rod, and it uh, is just a 1032 thread without any turning down necessary. So I blued it up, marked the threaded area, and then proceeded to try and cut it with a die in my tailstock die holder, and the die would not start. My usual solution to this is just to cut a few thou off the OD, and then the die will start, and it just would not. This stainless was just too tough. The die had no hope. So I had to give up on the die. I didn't want to take the OD down any further, and uh, tapering the end also didn't help. So. Uh, next up was to uh, single point cut the thread. So I swapped the change gears and set up to do that. Quick scratch pass and a check with the thread gauge and it looks good. We're set up for 32 threads per inch. So away we go. One notable thing about this is when I'm cutting small threads like this, I don't bother with the compound. I'm just feeding in straight with the cross slide and then using the indicator there on the tool post to tell how far in I've gone. And it works just fine with really small threads like this. The whole 29 and a half degree angle thing is just not necessary. For example, on the next thread that you'll see, the total thread depth is 13 and a half thou, which is like a single pass on a larger thread. The other thing of note here is that I'm cutting away from the chuck, which is my preferred method. You just flip the tool over, run the lathe in reverse, and uh, no drama about uh, running into the shoulder of your cut or the chuck. Of course, don't do this if your chuck is threaded on because you may unthread the chuck by doing this. There's an interesting subtlety that I wanna call out while I'm doing this. Anytime you're making a part where the factory stock is one of your reference surfaces, then you have to be extra careful about concentricity. So the chuck is referencing on the OD of this stock, but nothing is going to get turned down on that OD. So whatever I cut on the end is going to be subject to whatever runout is in my three jaw chuck, which, you know, on these cheap chucks is somewhere in the neighborhood of five thousandths. So technically, the features that I'm cutting on the ends of these rods are going to be out by as much as five thou. Now these are just threads, so it's not a big deal, but if I was cutting concentricity critical features, then you're gonna wanna do something like use a collet chuck or uh, dial it in with a four jaw, find a way to hold it in the four jaw and dial in the OD before you cut the features, something like that. Not a big deal for these little parts, but something to think about. Before I do anything else, uh, I'm gonna make the nuts that go with all these threaded rods. So I've got some hex stock here that came with the kit for the 1032 nut of which I need one. I'll make sure I've got room to part off here and I'll face off the end as is tradition. Three jaw chuck is very handy for holding hex stock like this. And I'm gonna center drill and then drill this the tapping size for 1032. So far so easy. I'm tapping this with the tap held in a tap wrench using a spring loaded tap follower in the tailstock as you've seen me do many times before on my channel. A quick deburr 
And now we're ready for the pièce de résistance. If you've ever looked at a commercially produced nut, you'll notice that it has these really nice rounded corners on it. And that makes the, the nut really comfortable to hold and handle. It looks like a complex feature, but it turns out to be very easy to do. That's actually just the interaction of a chamfer with the hexagonal geometry. So throw in the chamfer tool, apply that, and you can see how nice the result is. And I'm using an indicator to move the carriage over the correct amount to part it off to the thickness that I want. It's not super critical, this dimension, but uh, I'll try to make it nice. And then I'm going to part in part way, pardon the pun, and then come in with a needle file and chamfer the back corner there. Most commercial nuts have a smaller chamfer on the back, so that's what I'm doing here. And then we can part it off. Yahtzee! Over on the bench, I'll do a little more deburring on that back side there. And let's see how it looks on the piston rod that we just made. And that thread's on there really nice, and you can see how nice that looks. You know, commercial hardware these days is all stamped and rolled and formed and cast and pressed. So machined hardware, by comparison, always just looks really lovely. We also need three much smaller 540 nuts, so the kit came with stock for this as well. So I'll be making these the same way, except that because we need three of them, I'm going to do a little bit of mass production here. So I'm tap drilling all the way through, enough room for all of the nuts, and then I'm tapping all three, again, all the way through. And then I deburr the outermost nut, and I chamfer, and again, part, chamfer, finish the part, and then move on to the next one. Now, if you have to make a lot of small nuts, I'm going to link down below to a video by Mr. Crispin. He's fantastic, and he has a very clever way to mass produce nuts on the lathe that I really think you should watch. I learn a lot from his videos, and he deserves way more views than he's getting, so link below. Now, I haven't cut the 540 thread on the other end of the piston rod yet because I'm also going to make the valve rod, which has a 540 thread on both ends. So I'm prepping this piece of stock just like I did the piston rod, facing the ends, facing it down to length, and then I'm going to mark the threaded area on this. And now I can set up the lathe to single point cut 540 threads and do all three at once. I'm not even going to try a die this time because I know it's not going to work. So as I did with the 1032 thread, I'm doing a scratch pass and then I get out the thread pitch gauge to see if I'm on target. And you know, moments like this I realize why the older a person gets, the larger the model steam engines they build get. Because I am right on the edge of being too old to single point cut a 540 thread with these eyes. Now this was going okay, but I am getting some deflection here. This part is so thin and stainless is so tough to cut that it uh, really wasn't very happy. I was doing a lot of spring passes. As I got closer to final dimension, I was doing two or three spring passes for every cut just to get that deflection out of the part before the next pass. And this first one went good, so I flipped it around, tried to do the other one, and look what happened. So that deflection that I talked about got the better of me on the second end. It, def it was deflecting a little bit on each pass, and that deflection work hardened it, and then it just snapped off. And you can see that it bent the rod in the process. So I ordered some new stainless steel rod for this and proceeded to make that bar again. Now, how am I going to cut these threads? Single point cutting didn't work, a die won't work, what should I do? What I decided to do was I cut the threads halfway down, single pointing them, and then I finished them with the die. Because the first half is where the die has trouble, it has trouble starting. And the second half is where single pointing has trouble, because the cut starts to get deep and turn into a form tool. So, did the first half, single point, finished it with a thread, and that worked really, really well. Actually, I should have been doing this all along. It probably also would have worked if I'd gotten some tail support in there. The diameter of the stock is very, very small, but there's probably just enough for a small center in there. So at the piston end, I need that 540 thread area plus the shoulder that I'm going to make. So I'm turning all of this down to 1 8 and I may turn the threaded area down a little bit more. It's uh, helpful with the thread cutting, but I'll try it without for now. So that's looking good. We're just a few tenths under there. And I'll blue that up and mark the length of the threaded area. And the rest of it will be the shoulder that locates the piston. So we've got the valve rod and the piston rod and all of the nuts that go on there. It's looking good, except that I'm not happy with that finish on the piston rod. So I'm going to be dealing with that later. But let's move on to the piston. So the kit came with this really nice piece of round bar. And so I'm going to face the end off, as is tradition. 
this stuff is machining really, really beautifully. Like, I don't know what this stuff is. It's definitely leaded, but it machines even nicer than the 12L14 that uh, I often use. So whatever this stuff is, it's uh, magical. The dimension on this is specified as uh, one inch, but zero to two thou under. And in the cylinder, you may recall, is zero to two thou over. So we want to be somewhere between zero and four thou smaller than the cylinder. So I'm aiming for a little under on the piston, and then that'll put me within striking distance. You may recall that my cylinder is one thou under, and the piston here is one and a half thou under. So that way I can hone myself into between one and two thou of clearance there on the piston, which should be just perfect. And I'll just break that corner with a chamfer tool and let's do a little test fit on the cylinder. And yeah, that fits on there really nicely. So there's about a 1,000 clearance on there right now. And if I need a little more, I can polish or hone my way to get there. All right, I'm going to switch over to a chuck now and I'm going to center drill and then drill and then ream the center here to eighth of an inch for the piston rod end. So I'm going to read this all the way through, but then of course we're going to counterbore this for clearance for the area where the nut sits. And there's the piston rod and that slides in there nice. And you could see the shoulder that I put in there to keep it concentric on the piston. I'm really glad I did that. And now I'm going to set up to cut the piston ring grooves. I happen to have a grooving tool that was the right width for this. So I set up with the indicator to put it in the right place and I'm going to start grooving my way down. Now the dimension is difficult to check. I went in to the required depth of 50 thou based on the cross slide hand wheel dial, but it was hard to check because none of my measuring tools were small enough to get in there except the machinist scale. So I used that and it seemed right. It's not super precise, but uh, I did a test fit with the ring as well. And the ring seems like a good fit in there. It's hard to know how much the rings should be proud of the surface, if at all. So we're going to be doing some fine tuning here in a minute, but I cut the other groove to the same depth and then I deburred everything carefully with a tiny needle file as best I could. As you'll see here in a minute, this actually wasn't quite sufficient. Now to cut the big counter bore, I'm going to cheat. I've got a Morse Taper 2 end mill holder with a piece of threaded rod in the end to make it long enough for the tailstock to eject it. And I'm going to put an end mill in here that's the final dimension of my counter bore. I'm setting the distance from the surface with a feeler gauge there. It's a 20 thou feeler gauge. Then I set the indicator to positive 20 because we're feeding away from the indicator. So we're going negative on the dial. And then I just feed into the desired depth. The exact dimension on this counterbore is not super critical. So it doesn't matter if I cut it a little oversized with this end mill. You can see I'm using a toolmaker's clamp there to register the indicator. I call this cheating because this actually isn't great for your tail stock. If there isn't an anti-rotation tang on the end of what's going into your Morse taper, and if the Morse taper doesn't have a place for that anti-rotation tang like a drill press does, if the cutting forces get too high, you can spin that Morse taper in the tailstock, and then you're going to damage your tailstock taper. So don't get carried away with that technique, but you know, in a situation like this, it sure does make an easy and fast counter bore. I deburred that with this handy Noga tool. And I'm just going to double check my depth here. Again, this isn't critical as long as it's deep enough for the end of the rod and the nut to clear so that it doesn't hit the end of the cylinder bore, then we're golden. It's really starting to look like a piston now and we can part it off. Once again, I go in part way and then I just deburr the backside of that cut there with a small needle file and then I can finish the part. And Yahtzee! And then I'm going to flip this around and face the back. Now, while I'm doing that, if you've ever wondered why steam engine pistons are so skinny compared to internal combustion engine pistons, there's a couple of reasons for that which are interesting. First of all, steam engines are generally double acting, so they need to be skinny so that you have the same amount of gas expansion area on either side of the piston. And also, they don't need a skirt on the bottom like a gas engine does because they have a crosshead. The crosshead keeps the piston rod travel straight compared to a gas engine where you've got a connecting rod that's swinging back and forth. And so the piston needs a deep skirt on it to stay straight in the bore. So there you go. Steam engine pistons are always skinny. With that face down to final dimension, it's time for some test fitting. So I get the rings on there. And these are PTFE or Teflon rings. They got a little ring gap there, so I guess... Theoretically, you should have the ring gaps 180 degrees apart, but I don't know how much that's really going to matter in an engine like this. I'll get the piston rod on there and the little brass nut. 
it's looking very, very nice. You can see what a high polish is on that piston there. That's that, that steel just machined and polished really nice. Okay, moment of truth. Does it go in the bore? So get a little assembly oil on there. And it does not. The front edge of the piston goes in as we expected, but the first ring will not go in there. So I measured the OD of the rings and they are about five thou proud of the surface. So that's problem number one. Problem number two, as you can see now, even without the rings, the piston doesn't go in. That latter problem is definitely down to insufficient deburring. I can easily measure the burrs with the micrometer and see that it won't fit in the bore anymore. To fix the burrs, I'm gonna use the piston rod as a mandrel, throw it back in the lathe and just polish the OD of that piston a little bit more and that'll bring those burrs back down again. Now the rings being too proud of the surface is tougher. I have to deepen those piston ring grooves, unfortunately. So I'm gonna to have to set up to do that. So I'm gonna to try to use the piston rod again as a mandrel. And because I'm in the three jaw chuck, we're gonna have run out here after rechucking it. So what I'm doing is just rotating the part and clamping it in different positions until I find one that has minimal amount of run out. And you can find a spot here that has less than a thou of run out with a little patience. And now I'm gonna put a little center drill in the end of that because I'm gonna put tail support in here. This piston rod's very thin and it's not gonna be sturdy enough to support this grooving operation that I'm gonna to try to do. So I line up the grooving tool just by feel and then we're ready to give it a shot. Now the question is, is the nut strong enough to hold against the machining forces? The answer is, no it's not. So we'll need a plan B. But this wasn't a waste of time because remember I wanted to fix the finish on this piston rod anyway, so I left it set up with the center and just polished it up while I had it here and now it looks very nice indeed. Okay, but to fix those grooves, I'm gonna need a fixture. So, threw a piece of scrap in there, face off the end, and then turned down the OD here to fit the recess that's in one end of the piston. And then that should be a real close fit on there and that looks good. And then I just center drilled, drilled, and tapped the end of this for a small bolt. The hole was just the right size for 540, which of course is what it's designed for. So I actually just used one of the 540 bolts that came in the kit. And I've got a piece of emery paper in there, uh, rough side out to protect the part. And that gives a better grip there on that flat washer. This is an old school trick for turning flat parts. I'll check it with an indicator and wow, that's within a couple of tenths on there. So we got really good concentricity on the piston when we made it and on this mandrel. Great news. Now I can go in and deepen those grooves. And this went very, very well. It's just a matter of deepening them a couple thou at a time until I felt like the piston fit was right. Obviously I should have done this check before removing it after cutting the grooves the first time, but I think I thought the rings were gonna be squishier than they are and they're really not very squishy at all. So we are within striking distance now on that piston fit, but it needs a little more fine tuning. And one thing that's happening is my rings are bottoming out because the overall OD is about a thou smaller than uh, it's really supposed to be. I'm kind of in the two to one thou under range and I'm supposed to be in the zero to two thou over range on the whole assembly. So uh, I just filed the ring gaps a little bit and then I did a little more cylinder honing and now I've got a really nice fit in there. I also found it's really helpful to install the inboard head while you're checking the fit because that'll keep the piston rod straight. It's easy to think the fit isn't good, but what's actually happening is you're just getting a little crooked as you pull the rod in and out by hand. The last little fine tuning is I wanted to turn down the end of that piston rod thread a little bit. It was a little proud of the piston. So now it's below and that's great. Now we can put the nut back on and there is our final piston assembly looking really good. It's running really well in that bore. Really happy with how this turned out. I was uh, surprised at uh, how challenging this turned out to be. I had never worked with really small stainless parts like this. So I learned a lot doing that, but I'm very happy with this result. I hope you enjoyed watching me make it. Thank you very much for watching. Throw me some love on Patreon if you're enjoying this series and the rest of my videos, and we will see you next time.